The lawyers representing Covington High School student Nick Sandman have sent out about 50 letters to various organizations and individuals for libel and defamation. This is the first step in a lawsuit. Now, in my opinion, it's very likely these organizations will settle. But it is a fact that many of these organizations produced false statements of fact. That is, they slandered, they defamed, and they libeled these individuals. And thus, it's very likely they'll just settle out of court. But many people on the left have been quick to defend some of these celebrities, saying that calling for the doxing of an individual isn't a crime and it's not punishable on Twitter. Thus, Kathy Griffin hasn't been removed. However, there was precedent set in a recent case against the Daily Stormer that shows the First Amendment does not protect an individual when they target others in a harassment campaign. It's a very interesting case. And we also have another story from Colette about how these fake news stories have real and damaging consequences. A story about a man who was driven to suicide because the fake news would not relent. But before we get started, make sure you're following me on Minds at Minds.com slash Timcast. We are going to be launching the Subverse show very, very soon, and we're gonna build out a digital newsroom on Minds so that you can all participate. I don't know what it'll exactly look like, but sign up and follow me, and we'll be launching the Subverse channel very, very soon. If you wanna support my work, you can simply share this video and help spread the message. From Cincinnati.com, Sandman Lawyer. Letters sent to New York Times, Today Show, 50 others may precede suits. The lawyers representing Covington Catholic High School student Nick Sandman and his family said Friday that they have sent letters to media outlets, individual journalists, celebrities, and Catholic organizations as the first step in possible libel and defamation lawsuits. The list includes 50 plus names of organizations or individuals from presidential hopeful Elizabeth Warren to actress Alyssa Milano. Individual journalists, including Maggie Haberman, Anna Cabrera, and David Brooks, national media outlets like the New York Times, CNN, GQ, and TMZ, and the Diocese of Covington and Lexington, as well as the Archdiocese of Louisville and Baltimore. Nick, as well as his school, faced threats from those angered by video showing him, his classmates, and Native Americans engaged in a much debated confrontation. Some of the students wore Make America Great Again hats. Some students chanted and performed the tomahawk chop. The legal counsel representing Nick and his family, Todd McMurtry, and experienced libel and defamation lawyer L. Lynn Wood of Atlanta have said they will seek justice for the harm allegedly done to the teen. McMurtry set an example of false reports where those saying Nick got into the face of Phillips. McMurtry added his belief that some in the aftermath of the incident permanently stained Nick's reputation. This week, they have prepared documentation preservation letters addressed to organizations and individuals they believe may have defamed or libeled Nick with false reporting, McMurtry said. McMurtry said the following organizations and people are those who can expect to receive the letters, which were all sent by the close of business on Friday. We can see this is a pretty serious list. The Washington Post, The New York Times, CNN, The Guardian, NPR, TMZ, The Atlantic, Capitol Hill Publishing Corp, the Diocese of Covington and Lexington, the Diocese of Baltimore, Anna Cabrera, Sarah Sidner, Aaron Burnett, Amanda Watts. The list is huge. I'm not going to read every single name, but we can see many left-leaning celebrities and organizations, even Bill Maher and HBO. What's particularly fascinating about Bill Maher's case is that he made statements well after the fact. When news organizations had corrected their reporting, Bill Maher still went on his show and misrepresented what happened with these kids, making it seem as though Nick Sandman got in the face of the Native American, which was just not true. They know they crossed the line, McMurtry said. Do they want 12 people in Kentucky to decide their fate? I don't think so. He added that those on the list will raise legal defenses and challenges that we'll have to overcome, but that's the way it goes. The letters tell the organizations and individuals not to destroy any documents in connection with the case, the attorney said. For example, the documents could be drafts or early versions of articles or emails among staff discussing the story. McMurtry said he and Wood sent slightly different letters, but there were no substantive differences between them. The letter itself has been published from February 1st. We can see that the second paragraph says, please preserve all information that may be relevant to the Sandman matter. If our clients pursue litigation, we intend to serve XXXXX with discovery requests to access your computer networks and systems and to seek the production of relevant documents and communications. When it comes to slandering, libeling, or defaming a public figure, it's actually very, very challenging because there's something called slap laws or anti-slap laws. These are known as strategic lawsuit against public participation. And basically, if you're a public figure, then people have a right to criticize you and say what they think about you because that's part of being in the public. But Nick Sandman is a private individual, and that means the burden is much lighter on him than it would be on a public figure. All he has to show is that they didn't do their job. They didn't do basic investigation and reported things that were wrong. One of the most notorious examples still exists today from January 20th. 
The crowd of students, some of whom wore MAGA caps, mocked Native Americans while chanting build the wall and using derogatory language. This is absolutely false. This never happened. And that's just the one example from USA Today. I'm sure most of you who have followed the story know full well that the media didn't even bother watching the video of what happened. In one of the first videos released, you can clearly see that the Native American man, Nathan Phillips, walked up to Nick Sandman. I saw that right away. And I questioned some high-profile individuals who I know saying, I don't understand, the Native American walked up to the kid, why is everyone so angry? But it's almost like they didn't care. They didn't watch it. But what I think really happened is that these journalists all follow each other and they didn't break out of their bubble. So they assumed this must be true. But more importantly, they didn't do their job. Journalists aren't supposed to just watch a short clip. They're supposed to investigate to figure out what actually happened. And so few people did it. Is it surprising to anybody that much of the correct narrative came out from YouTubers and other independent personalities well before the mainstream media? How many other independent journalists were able to break this story before the Washington Post, USA Today, the New York Times? I have no idea. But I think it's fair to point out the media is not doing too well. We just saw all these layoffs and they couldn't even get this story right. But there's another interesting bit in this story. Many people are saying that what Kathy Griffin did, for instance, her and others calling for the docs of these individuals, that means she was telling people to go and seek out their names and their private data. They say, well, that's not necessarily illegal, but she may still be liable for civil damages based on a lawsuit where the alt-right, the Daily Stormer, was harassing a woman and lost. But first, let's take a look at what Kathy Griffin did and why she's probably in trouble. From the Daily Wire, Kathy Griffin tweets, deletes photo of Covington students holding up, quote, new Nazi sign. Three pointers are racist. Griffin tweeted, Covington's finest throwing up the new Nazi sign. However, for anybody who knows literally anything about basketball, that's the sign for a three pointer. Everybody does it. As Twitchy points out, the screenshot has been making the rounds online, accompanied by some well-earned shaming of Griffin. She did delete the three-pointer tweet, but one of her original tweets about Covington could actually get her in trouble for harassment or for inciting harassment. She tweeted, The reply from the school was pathetic and impotent. Name these kids. I want names. Shame them. If you think these effers wouldn't dox you in a heartbeat, think again. And then she tweeted out two images. Responding to another Twitter user, she said, names please, and stories from people who can identify them and vouch for their identity. Live by the sword, die by the sword. When precedent is set, when you are in a fight, it will be used against you as well. From Ars Technica back in November, judge rejects neo-Nazis first amendment right argument in harassment case. Victim was flooded with hundreds of violent and anti-Semitic images. When Andrew Anglin isn't editing his neo-Nazi website, The Daily Stormer, he organizes harassment campaigns against perceived enemies. One target of an Anglin harassment campaign, Tanya Gersh, sued Anglin last year. On Wednesday, a Montana federal judge dealt Anglin a significant setback, holding that the First Amendment does not protect Anglin's right to publish Gersh's personal information and encourage his legion of anti-Semitic followers to harass her. Many people on the left cheered, and many people defending free speech said this is a terrible setback for free speech. Just because you have followers, you are liable. But to an extent, telling people to do something could cross the line. Harassment is illegal in many jurisdictions. So if you go on Twitter and instruct people to do something, you might actually face civil or maybe even criminal penalties. In that story, they specifically outlined how Andrew Anglin is not protected by the First Amendment when he instructed his fans to engage in harassment against this woman. Kathy Griffin did the exact same thing, as did many other people on Twitter. Now, why Twitter hasn't banned them? Well, because Jack Dorsey is a duplicitous snake who doesn't actually believe anything he says and goes on the Joe Rogan podcast and doesn't actually answer the question. So there's no surprise there. And full disclosure, I'm very clearly biased against Twitter. They're a trash platform. And the fact that Kathy Griffin hasn't been banned, well, that's another reason why I just really, really hate Twitter and actively encourage people to get away from it. But more importantly, let's talk about fake news. While we don't know what's going to happen with Kathy Griffin and many of these people who have smeared the Covington kids, it's very likely, in my opinion, that they're going to pay out a settlement because nobody wants to go to court. But the truth is, fake news has very serious and real consequences. You get harassed by these journalists. They frequently engage in harassment campaigns. And Covington is just one example. They like to claim that other people are radicalizing kids. They like to claim that other people are engaging in harassment campaigns. But the media frequently does this. Why? It's the banality of evil. They're not trying to destroy lives. 
They just want that juicy story at all costs. And that means they will mislead, misinterpret, and not do their job, and thus destroy the livelihood of many individuals. A few days ago, this story was published in Quillette, The Death of a Dreamer. The story is about a man who was giving a presentation about genetic engineering. At one of his presentations, he made a silly off-the-cuff comment about how gene editing could change feminine odors. But the media, thinking they've got something salacious, decided to run with this narrative. And the narrative went far and wide, repeatedly. In the story, they have a quote from this man's sister. It was pretty heart-wrenching to see him suffer like that in the media. It was clickbaity stuff. Article after article after article got written because the headline was interesting. It was so infuriating. I don't think I realized how devastating it was for Austin until later. She says he couldn't stop talking about it. In March, Hines ordered a selection of ropes from the internet and tried to hang himself. He failed. When he came to, he called his sister and told her that he had just tried to kill himself. The family took him on a break to wine country and staged an intervention one evening. After dinner, he kept saying that he was dead. We said, we are going to take you to the hospital. We are going to get you the help you need. On 27 May 2015, a member of the Cambrian Genomics team opened up the laboratory after a long weekend and discovered his body. Austin Hines had hanged himself. He was 31. My general understanding of the story, I encourage you to read it. I'll put the link in the description because I could be wrong, is that this guy made a seemingly off-the-cuff comment that had very little to do with his core research, his core work. But these digital clickbait sites saw they had something and ran with it. And they wouldn't stop. It was like a game of telephone. The story kept getting worse. And no matter what he did, they kept slamming him. Eventually, it affected his business. He couldn't continue. And he became depressed, ultimately killing himself. This is a serious issue. And these media companies do engage in harassment campaigns. They have driven people to end their lives. And it's about time they get held accountable. And that's what we're seeing with Covington. Possibly the most egregious example would be Covington. None of these organizations, including high-profile media outlets, did any basic fact-checking. They didn't bother. It was only days later they corrected themselves. And how? I have no idea. Bill Maher and other personalities got the story wrong days later. It blows my mind. I think the main problem is Twitter. These journalists, these producers, they don't bother doing the work they need to do, the due diligence. They go on Twitter, they follow people within their bubble, and they don't see anything outside of it. And thus, they believe what they're seeing is the real world, but it's not. And now they're going to face the consequences. So personally, I hope to see massive damage is paid out to these kids because media should not be allowed to get away with publishing mass fake news in a harassment campaign backed by celebrities and the mainstream media. Let me know what you think in the comments below. We'll keep the conversation going. Make sure to follow me at minds.com slash Timcast. Like I said, we'll be building out this digital newsroom with Subverse, so we'll figure that out as we go, and I'd like you all to be there to help make this happen. More videos on this channel every day at 4 p.m., and I'll have more videos on my second channel, youtube.com slash Timcast News, starting at 6 p.m. Thanks for hanging out, and I will see you all next time.